Okay, so up until this point, we have had two categories of, of energy, and that's still going to be true. Two categories of energy, kinetic energy, and kinetic energy is the energy of what? Objects that are moving. Very good, because kina means motion. Okay, so kinetic energy means objects that are in motion, and that equation has velocity in it, right? The second type of category of energy we looked at was potential energy, and we studied potential energy of gravity, right? So gravitational potential energy. And that is what it increases as something gets higher into the air, right? Because that is the potential to fall. Okay, but if I was gonna give just a general, like really general definition for potential energy, what would, we, what would you say potential energy is? Do you remember kind of how we described this at the very beginning? Potential energy is energy that is stored, Okay, so potential energy is stored energy. It's what we have the potential to do. Okay, and so gravitational potential energy means we have the potential to fall. And now spring potential energy or elastic potential energy means uh, it's the stored energy within the spring, right? When we, when we use these terms, stretch and compress, um, we're able to store energy into that spring. Because if I were to let go of an energy that was, or I'm sorry, of a spring that was compressed like that, what would happen? Right. If I compress a spring down and then I let go, what happens? It yeah, it bounces back and forth until it eventually reaches what's called an equilibrium. Okay, so these three terms are ones we, we should be familiar with with um, springs. Okay, For a spring to be static, what does that mean? What's it mean for a spring to be static? That's right. It's not stretched or compressed. It's just at its rest. Right? It's just at its most relaxed state. Okay, and then compressed, of course, means to squeeze it together. And stretched, of course, means to pull it apart. So when we start looking at these, these objects, if a spring is anywhere besides its static position, then it would contain potential energy. Okay, so it contains potential energy if it's being compressed and if it's being stretched. Right, It's not like one or the other. If it has either one of those characteristics happening, it would contain potential energy, okay? So here's the types of potential energy we're talking about, elastic and springs. And elastic, it means the same thing, right? We're, we're looking at, at things that are coming back together. So here's the equation for the potential energy of a spring, okay? One half kx squared. And this one should go on your equation sheet as well. One half kx squared. The K value here is what's called a spring constant. And the X value is the distance that it has been stretched or compressed. Okay. So even though here our K value is called a spring constant, it, it's, it's a little misleading because it's not truly a constant value. The spring constant is dependent upon the individual spring that we are examining, okay? So the spring constant uh, is individualized, right? Each spring has its own value of a spring constant, and it measures essentially how stiff the spring is, right? How difficult that it is to stretch or compress. So a low spring constant would mean your spring is very, very lightweight, very easy to stretch and compress. And then a, a really high spring constant would mean that we have really stiff spring. It's tough, right? It's meant to just give a little tiny bit. So let's examine two extremes of that, okay? Think about the spring that is in your pen, right? Little spring in here. Do you think it has a high spring constant or a low spring constant? Is it difficult or, or easy to make that go? It's really easy. This would be a really low spring constant, right? Because it is not difficult to make that spring stretch or compress. Now I want to go opposite end of the spectrum. Think about the suspension springs in your car. Okay, when I say suspension, that means like that's what keeps your car from bouncing too much, right? So think about those springs in your car. Those would have to have a really high spring constant because we want those bumps in the road to be kind of dampened, 
right? That's the whole purpose of a car suspension is that it allows that ride to be nice and smooth, right? It absorbs all of those little movements, those little bumps in the road without making you go bounce, bounce, bounce while you're in the car, right? That's kind of the point of that. So we see springs with really, really different ranges there, okay? Um, X in this equation is the distance that it is stretched or compressed from the static's position. And so this needs to be measured in meters, okay? It needs to be measured in meters. If you think about a spring, it would be rare that we would be able to compress a spring a whole meter, right? Usually that value is given to us in centimeters. So we need to make sure that we're cognizant of that and we're able to convert that, okay? The unit for a spring constant is Newton divided by meters, okay? So if you see that um, unit in the problem, you can automatically identify that as K, okay? Um, the spring constant is something that you might be given in the question. It might ask you to solve for the spring constant. And so it's not one that you will memorize because it's not a, a single uh, number. It's not a single constant. Okay. So that's the type of potential energy um, that I just wanted to introduce a little bit there. But we're going to look now today at um, what's called mechanical energy, which is the sum, okay, the total energy in a system. Okay, so if I'm looking at an object and it has both kinetic and potential energy, that would be called its mechanical energy. And so an object's mechanical energy, or just E, is measured by adding kinetic energy plus the potential energy of our object. Okay, so you could even say E is equal to one half mv squared plus mgh, right? Kinetic plus potential. You don't have to write this one down yet. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger, still I'm gonna expand these together because this is the energy uh, at, at one point in our system, right? If it would ask me how much energy is just contained in this object at this point, I could solve for that. But now really what we're going to, start, we're gonna move into is trying to prove the conservation of energy. Okay, so what does conservation of energy mean? We talked about it briefly at the beginning of the chapter. What does the conservation of energy mean? Okay, same with conservation of mass or conservation of momentum. Okay, if we say uh, energy is neither created or destroyed, right? That's the law of conservation of energy. Energy is not created or destroyed. And so when we start looking at energy in a system, we have to understand that as my object moves through that system, it is not losing energy, right? It might be transforming it to a different type. It might be storing it, right? It might be doing all these different things, but it is not technically losing energy. It is transforming it. And so what we're going to look at here is what's called the uh, equation for the conservation of energy. And so I want to, I want to just talk through these equations. So just give me a second to talk through it before you start putting it on your equation sheet. I know this look like looks really intense and a little intimidating, but let me break it down first and then we'll, we'll see what we need here. Okay. So all we're saying is that the energy of the system at the beginning is equal to the energy of the system at the end, right? That's what the law of conservation, conservation of energy says, that energy at the beginning is equal to the energy at the end, right? If I'm looking at two points of my system. So let's think roller coaster here, okay? Because that's what the example that we use a lot in this um, chapter is here's my roller coaster, right? However much energy I have, at the beginning is going to be equal to the amount of energy I have right here, right? It might be in different categories. It might be split up, but the total amount of energy at point one and point two is equal. And that's really what we're doing here is laying out the, the proof of the conservation of energy. Okay, so once I, once I set up that equation, right, it says energy at the beginning equals energy at the end. And we know that this mechanical energy is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And so we just split that out on both sides, right? Kinetic plus potential equals kinetic plus potential. And then from there, all we did was plug in the equations for kinetic and potential energy on both sides. Okay, do you see how that works? So all we're doing here is saying energy at the beginning, energy at the beginning is equal to energy at the end. Okay. So I would like for you to have this equation right here, the blue one in the box. Let's go ahead and make sure that equation is on our equation sheet. Cause that's going to be a super, super important one for us to be able to use. Okay. That would be your conservation of energy equation.
All right, you can have two versions of this equation. One half mv squared kinetic plus potential. One half kx squared equals kinetic plus potential. Right, so this is just substituting that other version of potential energy in. This would be potential energy of a spring. Potential energy of a spring. So I think it might be helpful for you to have that second equation on there for conservation of energy in case our problem involves springs instead of gravitational potential energy. Okay, that way we can have both versions of that. Note ahead of time is that when we talk about objects at the beginning and the end of their motion, we have to understand that by the time the object hits the ground, right? We're going to call hits the ground at like right before it hits the ground, similar to how we did it with our first um, vertical kinematics problems, right? When we talk about an object, uh, you know, if this is the ground, we're talking about the object there, right? It's like almost on the ground. So that when it hits the ground, it comes to a stop. That's not what we're examining, right? We are examining the instant before it hits the ground. And so we, we can consider at this point that our height is equal to zero. Okay. Does that make sense? So by that time, all of our potential energy has been converted to kinetic energy, right? If we're at the lowest point in our system, we would have to have only kinetic energy. Okay, if we're anywhere in between, highest point and lowest point, we have both types of energy. And that's really what we've got to kind of keep examining as we go through our problems here. Okay, so let's look at this one. It says a stone is being held at a height of three meters. Calculate the stone's speed when it has fallen to one meter above the ground. Okay, so I'm going to draw out a little diagram here of what that's going to look like. It's, it's helpful for me, I think, in these problems, and it might be helpful for you too, to make sure that we draw it so we can really examine what's happening. All right, we want to know... What is my speed when it is one meter above the ground? What is my velocity, right, when it's one meter above the ground? So let's start examining types of energy. This is the question you have to ask yourself when we start these problems. At my starting point, at the beginning, what type of energy do I have? Do I have all kinetic? Do I have all potential? Or do I have both? You have any ideas? It's being held above the ground at a height of three meters. It's not going to have both yet, but what type for sure does it have? It has all potential. And the reason we know it doesn't have kinetic is because it says it's being held, right? It's not moving yet, right? The second that it has velocity, then we would consider it to have both, okay? What about at this point where it's one meter off the ground, but it's still falling? What type of energy would I have here? Do I, do I have kinetic? Is it, in mo is it in motion? Yes. And do I have potential? Is it still off the ground? Yes. So it would have kinetic and potential, right? It would have both there. Okay, so we've got to really think through those questions and be able to ask, our those with every, ask, ask ourselves those questions with every problem. So is it at its highest point? And if so, it's got all potential. Is it at its lowest point? If so, it would have all kinetic. And if it's anywhere in between, it has both. Okay? Um, so now let's, let's bring out our conservation of energy equation. Okay? Our conservation of energy equation says um, kinetic... plus potential equals kinetic plus potential, right? The left side is always my beginning side and the right side is always my ending side, okay? And so I'm gonna go through it and, and see, do I even need to use all four terms of that equation, right? Didn't we say on our beginning side we only had potential energy? So that means this automatically comes to a zero, right? Automatically, because my velocity was zero, so it automatically makes that term a zero, okay? 
Uh, it doesn't give me a mass in here, so I'm just gonna hold on to that for a second. I'm gonna leave it as M. So I'm gonna plug in M times G, and G we know is 9.8 times our height, right? Three meters is our height. Okay, one half, I don't know my mass, so I'm gonna leave that, and then I'm solving for velocity, so I have to leave V squared there, okay? Last one I have M times 9.8 times one, all right, because my final height is one meter. Okay, tell me, do we feel comfortable with how those numbers got plugged in there? Does that part make sense? Wait, so why does this zero? Why is this... Yep, right here. Why is that one zero? Yeah. Okay, so by asking ourselves these questions and identifying that at my beginning point, I had all potential energy, that would mean my equation here, which is kinetic energy plus potential energy, that's telling me that I have zero kinetic energy, right? I answered this question at the very beginning and I said, at my starting point, I only have potential energy. So that means this would be zero. Okay, another way, if you're not quite sure about that, I would say, well, at the beginning, what's my velocity? Well, it's still being held, so my velocity is zero, right? And then anything times zero is zero, okay? But I do think it's important to include that zero in the equation as we write it out because it tells me that, like, I thought about that term and I know it's zero, right? I didn't just accidentally leave it off, okay? So you'll see me write zero plus something, something equals whatever plus zero, right? I put those in so that I know I accounted for all four of my terms, Okay? All right, so now let's do the math. Um, go ahead and grab your calculators out if you don't have those, but let's go ahead and do the math here. So three times 9.8 times M. I'm gonna leave that M there for just a second and I'll show you what happens, okay? So 9.8 times three gives me 29.4 and it's still times M. So I'm gonna leave that M there, okay? This term actually just stays the same because I'm not solving anything there yet. So one half times M times V squared plus 9.8 times one times M gives me 9.8 M. Okay, so now I'm at a place where I have 29.4 M equals one half M V squared plus 9.8 M. Do you see a move we can make, right? Our overall goal is still to solve for velocity. Right, but do you see a move we can make to make to get that closer to that? Yeah, good. I'm gonna combine my like terms, right? 9.8 m and 29.4 m are like terms, so I'm gonna combine that. So I'm gonna subtract over 9.8 m minus 9.8 m. That gives me 19.6 m equals one half m v squared. Okay, so now do we see that our masses, since I'm multiplication on both sides, our masses just cancel, right? You see how that works? Algebraically, that mass is going to end up canceling out because this is all multiplication. 19.6 times m equals one half mv squared, right? These are multiplications so that m is just going to cancel. And so now I can take divided by one half, divided by one half, right? 19.6, divided by 0.5, that gives me 39.2 equals V squared. And then I do wanna go ahead and square root that value. So my velocity ends up at 6.26 .6 meters per second. Okay, I'm gonna have to include that negative. And my, my, my kind of rule for this is that if my object is in free fall, right? If it's in free fall, we're gonna consider that velocity negative, okay? So we had to do that. We had to add the negative because we took the square root of that value, right? And so when we take a square root, our true answer is plus or minus that number. So just like we did with vertical kinematics way, way, way back in chapter two or three, okay? How do we feel about that? Not too bad? Okay, we're just gonna get lots of practice with putting those four terms into play, right? Making sure we get our numbers uh, lined up correctly there, okay? All right, this one says, assuming the height of the top hill of a roller coaster is 40 meters 
and the car starts from rest at the top, calculate the speed of the car at the bottom of the hill. Okay, so let's draw out our roller coaster here. Okay, this says our height of our hill is 40 meters tall. So this height right here is 40 meters. And it says it's at rest, right? It's starting at rest. So what type of energy would my object have? What type of energy does my roller coaster cart have right now? All potential, right? All potential. And then it says, calculate the speed of the car at the bottom of the hill. So if I get to the bottom down here, what type of energy would I have? All, yep, all kinetic. Okay, if I was anywhere in between, if I was anywhere from here to here, what type would I have? I would have to have both, right? But I'm not, I'm not examining that right now. I'm just examining start to finish. And so my equation here is going to get a little simpler, okay? So if my equation is kinetic plus potential equals kinetic plus potential, I can take out two of those parts, right? Because at the beginning of my equation, my kinetic energy is zero plus potential energy. At the end, I have kinetic energy, but I said my potential energy was zero, right? Do you see how I can eliminate some terms of that equation if I know what types of energy I have, right? Initial kinetic energy was zero because we said my roller coaster has all potential. So at the beginning, all I'm putting in is potential. At the end, we said we have only kinetic. So only kinetic, no potential. Do we feel comfortable with setting up that equation? Okay, so now let's put in our values. Again, they didn't give us a mass. So I'm just going to leave it hang on as an M for right now. and I'm solving for velocity. All right, so 9.8 times 40. So 392m equals 1 half mv squared. And so my m values just cancel each other out. So I'll take 392 divided by 0.5, and then I'll square root that value, and I get 28 meters per second. Yeah, halfway down, right? That would be my guess too, right? At this point, will it have 14 meters per second? We don't know. But what we do know is that we are going to examine or find out what height somewhere along here, it doesn't really matter where we draw it, that our velocity is equal to 14 meters per second, right? Because that's half of the velocity we just solved for. And so in anywhere along the middle, what type of energy did we say we have to have? Do we have to have kinetic potential or both? Both. And so that means we're going to re, re, re ask our question here now and figure out at what height or how far above the ground does my object have a velocity of 14 meters per second? Okay. So I'm going to re ask my question here and I'm going to kind of ignore this part of it. Okay. I'm going to start with this, make that my starting point and make this my ending point. Okay, because I already know at the beginning how much energy is stored in that. So at the beginning, we said we had zero kinetic energy plus mgh, right? Kinetic plus potential. But at the end, we said we have both types of energy. So one half mv squared plus mg, and this time I'm solving for my height. Okay, so we're using three terms of our equation now instead of two. One, two, and three, right? No kinetic energy, all potential equals both kinds of energy on the right-hand side. Okay? How do we feel about being able to set that up? Not too bad? Okay, let's do the math now. So this becomes 392... M 
equals, and then I'm going to do the math for that 14 squared times a half. So that gives me 98m plus 9.8 times mh. Okay, so I can combine my like terms. Two ninety four M equals nine point eight M H. My M's will cancel. And so that means when I divide over that 9.8, my height is 30 meters. So that means at 30 meters above the ground, right? It hasn't traveled 30 meters, but it has a height of 30 meters. That's a difference, right? It hasn't traveled 30 meters. It has a height. So it's really only traveled 10 meters below. So at only a fourth of the way into our path, we've already picked up half of our speed, right? Do you guys like two different versions here? So I'm gonna, at, at point one, right at the beginning of my motion, here's my spring and here's my dart. Okay, my dart is attached to my spring right there and it's compressed. At point two, my spring is not compressed anymore and my dart has detached itself, okay? So this would be my spring like in its static position. That's where it's supposed to be. But at point one, it says it's compressed six centimeters. Does that drawing make sense to you? Is that, do we see what's happening there? We see a compression. And then when that spring gets to its normal state, right, when the spring gets to its full length, the, the dart detaches and it starts to fly. Okay, so let's, let's analyze what type of energy do we have in this first scenario. The spring is compressed, but everything's just waiting, right? It's in hold. So what type of energy would we have for part one here? Potential. All potential. And it's potential energy of a spring, Right? If you want to label it as PES, you can because it's potential energy of a spring. So all of the energy in the spring and even in the dart, right? The dart doesn't really have any energy yet, but all of the, spring, the energy that we have right now is contained in the spring. Then that spring gets sprung, right? It, it gets released. And that energy is transferred to the dart. And that energy transfer puts the dart into motion. And so what type of energy now is contained in the dart? All kinetic, right? All of the energy from the spring. Because now that my spring is static, right? If this is a static spring, that means that my potential energy of a spring is now zero, right? I, none of my energy is left in my spring because it's at its static position. And so all of that energy was transferred to the dart, Okay, and so we would, we would have all of the energy contained in the dart, which is now flying forward. Okay, so if I set up my equation, let's look at that again. Okay, my equation is normally kinetic plus potential equals kinetic plus potential. And so we said at the beginning we have zero kinetic energy, but we have only kinetic energy of a spring, one-half kx squared. Okay, then we said at the end, we have only kinetic energy and no potential energy left. Okay, do you understand? Why are we not using gravitational potential energy here? Why are we not using MGH? Yeah, this is horizontal, right? It's not vertical. That's okay. This is, this is not falling gravitationally, right? It's not, it's not free falling. It's not falling through the air. Um, this is moving horizontally, and it's propelled from a spring potential energy, not from gravity, right? Gravity is not what's making this dart move, right? It's the energy that was contained in the spring that's making it move. Okay, I want to pause for just one second. 
we are solving for what speed, right? So we're looking for velocity. That's our goal. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug in our other numbers. Zero plus one half K. Remember, K is our spring constant. And so it's given to us right there. 250. And then our X value is how far it has been compressed. So six centimeters. Do you remember what unit our X value or our compression value should be in? It needs to be meters. So we need to go ahead and convert six centimeters to meters. And so uh, how are we going to get there? Do you remember to convert centimeters to meters? What do we do? Think about the prefix centi. How many centimeters are in a meter? 100. Yep, 100. So we're going to divide that by 100. Right, and so that ends up with 0 0.06 squared. One half, and then the mass of the dart. Right, so we're going to use that mass of the dart. 0.1, and we're going to solve for V uh, or velocity there. For problems like this, you are given both a starting height and an ending height. So I really want you to have a picture of what's going on and understand what types of energy are we going to have at both the beginning and the end. Okay, so get a little diagram drawn, figure out your equation. If you want me to check your equation before you actually do the math, I'm happy to do that. Okay, but that way we don't go too far um, you know, down the wrong path. But I, I, I can look over that if you need. Here's my diagram. Here's the ground. So it starts at 13.3. It falls to a height of 6, which means it goes from all potential to both types. And so I set up kinetic plus potential equals kinetic plus potential. I don't know if your equation looks something like that, or did you have a little issue? Well, I, it says it falls on a roof. Mm -hmm. So I took that as that would be our ending point. Yeah, OK. So did you make, your, did you make this 7.3 and this 0? No, I didn't. Okay, so you just went 13.6, so I'd have to change. Did your equation look like this? Or you said no potential energy at the end? Any potential okay, energy. so if that was the case, you would be saying that your object is falling a total height of 13.3 oh, meters. Yeah. So if you were going to mm -hmm. act like the roof is your ground, this would only be 7.3. Okay. okay, so yeah. Even though, yes, right, it falls on the roof, I think it still has potential to go off the roof and on the ground. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a good question.